at this at moment in history. That is panic. I shall resign, I President. Not a date which will what live again in the infancy. The scenes are simply hellish. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Yes, we can. Good morning. We are the people. Good morning. The nation. Good morning. 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 Los Alamos National Laboratory was hidden in the deserts of New Mexico, a secret place where scientists from the Manhattan Project worked on the world's deadliest weapon, the atom bomb. The first nuclear bomb, codenamed the Gadget, was detonated on July 16, 1945, by lab director Robert Oppenheimer and Army General Leslie Groves. Oppenheimer described the experience with his famous quote from a Hindu holy text, and completely not over dramatic statement. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The two nuclear strikes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, with the bombs nicknamed Fat Man and Little Boy, killed over 200,000 people less than a month later, August 9, 1945. Emperor Hirohito broadcast the Japanese surrender to the Allies on August 14, which was the first time many of his own citizens had ever heard his voice. If he hadn't surrendered, the United States would have detonated a third atomic bomb over Japan four days later. But with this plan halted, the core of the unused bomb was saved for testing. All dressed up, nowhere to go. Even though it wasn't used for the war, it would still find an opportunity to take human lives. This core, made of the radioactive man-made material plutonium, secretly discovered and kept hidden until after the war, and this particular core was codenamed, and I'm 100% serious about this, Rufus. He would later earn the more fitting title of the Demon Core, for reasons we'll get to shortly. We'll get back to him soon. During Los Alamos National Laboratory's operation from 1943 to 1946, there were 24 fatalities, including multiple construction accidents, an unintentional shooting, a horseback riding incident, a drowning, an explosion, three janitors who died drinking wine laced with antifreeze, and two major accidents linked to Rufus the Demon Corps. Now let me introduce you to Daglian's friend and colleague, Louis Slotin. Louis Alexander Slotin was born on December 1st, 1910. He was the oldest of three children of Israel and Sonia Slotin, Jewish refugees who fled the pogroms of Russia and settled in an Eastern European immigrant neighborhood of Winnipeg, Canada. Slotin was something of a childhood whiz kid. His brother Sam would recall years later that Slotin had an extreme intensity that enabled him to study long hours, which I simply can't relate to, but Sam also remembered that Slotin would make him play games with his friends so he could be left alone to study. He started college at the University of Manitoba when he was only 16 years old, showing up our boy Daglin, the 17-year-old college freshman, and earned a university gold medal for physics and chemistry. He received his bachelor's in geology in 1932 and his master's in science a year later in 1933. He soon earned a chemistry fellowship at King's College, London, but he was more than just an egghead. During this time, he also took up amateur boxing and won the college championship, although he did joke with his brother that all he received for it was a black eye. He also went to Spain, which was in a period of brutal civil war, seeking excitement. It seems he may have originally claimed that he fought in the war as an anti-aircraft gunner, but later his brother Sam told reporters that Slotin had only gone on a walking tour and had not fought, so this is unclear. One article attempted to explain this by stating, quote, Slotin regularly amused himself with the gullible by planting false clues to an imaginary and stylish past. Many of his friends came to believe, for example, that he had fought with the Loyalists in Spain and had flown with the RAF, and this seemed to please some strain of romance in him." Unquote. Little did he know he would earn a place in the history books without any need for exaggeration. In 1936, Slotin received his PhD in physical chemistry, becoming the newly minted Dr. Slotin. He also worked for six months on Dublin's Great Southern Railways, testing rechargeable nickel-zinc batteries. He was rejected from a position with Canada's National Research Council, prompting his move to the U.S. to research nuclear chemistry with the University of Chicago. 
He built the first cyclotron in the Midwest, which may sound like the name of a transformer, but is actually a type of particle accelerator that produced a material known as radiocarbon. The position did not pay well at all, and Slotin spent this time of his life being financially supported by his father. He also did work on how plant cells use CO2 for carbohydrate synthesis, so I can partially thank Slotin for that unit of ninth grade biology, which is one of only two things I remember that, and the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Eventually, Slotin's publications on radiobiology earned him an invitation to the Manhattan Project, one that in hindsight, he for sure should have said no to. In 1944, he started at Los Alamos in New Mexico to work on bomb physics. He worked on criticality experiments with uranium and later plutonium, where he would encounter, that's right, say it with me, Rufus. Slotin also established himself as a risk-taker with a disregard for protocol in a particular incident described by his colleague, Dr. K.Z. Morgan, as follows. Quote, It was Friday afternoon, and Lewis wanted to shut down the reactor to make adjustments to an experiment at the bottom of the tank of water, which was used to absorb radiation. We said that was impossible, and we planned to shut down the reactor that weekend. When we came back on Monday morning, I found that Lewis had stripped down to his shorts, dived into the tank and made the adjustments underwater. I was appalled that anyone would take such risks. It shows what kind of person he was. He was like a cowboy, but a good experimental scientist." Unquote. He was not wearing a dosimetry badge, which the scientists were supposed to wear to measure their exposure to radiation. Of course, he wasn't wearing most of his clothes, so he might have an explanation for that one. Slotin created the core of Trinity, which was the first atomic device to be detonated, and it earned him the title of Chief Armorer of the United States, as well as several commemorative lead pins, because this man simply wasn't touching enough deadly materials. He kept the paper receipt that he received for delivering the bomb as a treasured memento. He was unable to travel to the military base for the launch of Fat Man and Little Boy, because he had not fully completed his American citizenship process yet. At the end of World War II, Slotin began training a replacement for himself, as he wanted to return to teaching and research at the University of Chicago, which is kind of a bummer considering how things turn out for him. It is likely that he would have left sooner, however his expertise was needed. He said, quote, I have become involved in the Navy tests, much to my disgust. I am one of the few people left here who are experienced bomb putter-togetherers, which is a title I would love to drop on LinkedIn. And his desire to leave was hastened by the fact that Slotin was uneasy about his participation in projects that caused such devastation during the war. It may have also been sped along by his upset over his assistant and friend Dagbian's death, but if that accident was assigned to Ron from Los Alamos, Slotin didn't heed the warning quick enough. Let me take you to May 21st, 1946, six months after Dagbian's death. Slotin was demonstrating an experiment for seven of his colleagues. He had Rufus the Demon Core, which radiated a constant warmth from its radioactivity, on a table in the center of the room. The plan was to create the first step of a fission reaction by slowly lowering a hemisphere of beryllium onto the 14-pound plutonium core that had killed Harry Daglian a year before. This dome, called a tamper, acted like the bricks Daglian had used to reflect neutrons back at Rufus. But it was vital that the tamper never completely covered the core to allow a gap for some neutrons to escape. Slotin was holding the tamper with his left hand through a thumb hole in the top and was keeping the hemispheres separate from each other with the blade of a screwdriver held in his right hand. Shockingly, this was not official protocol, as metal shims were usually used instead, but they had been removed. But then, at exactly 3.20 p.m., the screwdriver slipped, the hemisphere fell, and there was an instant burst of radiation. According to eyewitness reports, the room began to glow blue with ionization, and there was a wave of heat just like Daglian's accident. A sour taste filled Slotin's mouth, and his left hand began to burn. Slotin shielded his colleagues with his body and tried to end the reaction. An eyewitness said, quote, the total duration of the flash could not have been more than a few tenths of a second. Slotin reacted very quickly in flipping the tamper piece off, unquote. but it was already too late. According to another scientist in the room, Slotin knew the consequences of what he had done. 
He had stayed by his friend Harry Daglian's side in the hospital as he suffered from radiation poisoning, and when the blue glow of the room had faded, Slaughton's first words were, Well, that doesn't. On his way to the hospital, Slaughton also told a colleague, You'll be okay, but I think I'm done for. The security guard, Private Patrick Cleary, fled the room in terror while the room flashed and the scientists began to yell. The lab was evacuated and the scientists gathered outside to wait for ambulances to arrive. He recalled what happened as follows, quote, After the accident, I ran out the east door and down the ramp. Probably took me about five seconds or so. When I got to the gate, it was still locked and Mr. Klein, Seleski, and myself were the only ones there. Mr. Klein told the MP to open the gate. He had some trouble getting his whistle out of his pocket, but when he did, he opened the gates and then blew the whistle. I ran up the hill approximately 1,000 feet with the others. Pretty soon, Dr. Slotten and Mr. Young came out. Mr. Young called and told us to come down to the laboratory again. As soon as we got there, we drew a diagram to figure out approximately where everyone was when it happened. The only other conversation, everyone was wondering who had gotten most of the radiation, unquote. Slotten also tried to use a radiation detector on several objects in the room with them, including a Coca-Cola bottle and a bristle brush. However, the detector itself was contaminated with radiation, so the readings were not accurate. Luckily, a tool existed for this exact purpose. Film dosimetry badges were worn by Los Alamos scientists to measure people's exposure to radiation during an accident exactly like this. Unluckily, not a single person in the room was wearing their badge which was another break of protocol. A confused and sick Slotin sent one of his colleagues back into the contaminated lab to take the badges out of the locked lead box that they were in, but they were unusable. Slotin likely would have known this, but as a later report highlighted, after an exposure like this, people, quote, are in no condition for rational behavior, unquote. Slotin began vomiting immediately when he left the building and continued to do so throughout his first day in the hospital. When he arrived, he reiterated his sense of doom to colleague Alan Graves, saying, quote, I'm sorry I got you into this. I'm afraid I have less than a 50% chance of living. I hope you have better than that, unquote. On the second day, his condition actually seemed to get better. But on the third day, his condition steeply declined. The hand that had been holding the core became a waxy blue and blistered, and the doctors kept it packed in ice. He suffered intestinal distress, reduced urine output, swollen hands, erythema, blisters covering his arms, intestinal paralysis, and gangrene. The radiation throughout his body was described by a medical expert as a three-dimensional sunburn. Slotin made sure that while he was suffering the effects of the radiation poisoning, the doctors and scientists with him were using it as an opportunity for case study. He repeatedly discussed his test results with the doctors and nurses. General Leslie Groves, the same man who had been with Oppenheimer at the detonation of the gadget, was sent to retrieve Slotin's parents from Winnipeg, and they arrived on day four. By day five, his white blood cell count dropped severely, and by day seven, he was confused, his lips turned blue, and he was placed in an oxygen tent. He fell into a coma and died nine days after the accident, on May 30th, 1946 at age 35. He was buried in Winnipeg in a sealed army casket. As his family was Orthodox Jews, the army made sure that they brought their son home at sundown on a Friday, the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. Sam Slotin met them at the airport, and the local newspaper covered the event with the headline, Hero's Body Home. To further study the effects of the sickness, an autopsy was requested by the scientists. Although it was against their religious traditions, Israel Slotin agreed, saying, quote, Lewis had been a scientist all his life, and that when it could do him no harm, it would be wrong to prevent him adding to knowledge, unquote. Over 3,000 mourners attended his funeral. Four of Slotin's colleagues were discharged by May 25th, and the others were described to have a satisfactory condition. The observer who was closest to Slotin during the accident, Alan Graves, who Slotin was training as his replacement, not sure he wanted that job anymore, stayed in the hospital for several weeks with acute radiation poisoning, but he did survive, although he had vision and neurological problems the rest of his life. Three of the scientists, Graves, Klein, and Perlman, sued for compensation from the accident in 1948, 
Graves received $3,500. Three of the scientists later died from radiation-related illnesses that may have been affected by the accident. Graves died 20 years later, at age 55, from a heart attack. Selisky died 19 years later from acute leukemia at age 42. Young died of a plastic anemia and a bacterial infection of his heart 27 years later at age 83. One of those present during the accident, Private Patrick Cleary, died in 1950 in North Korea after being promoted to Sergeant First Class. Strangely, Slaughton and Daglian's accidents happened on the same day of the month, the 21st, and they reportedly died in the same hospital room, which only added to the Demon Corps' nefarious reputation. What happened to the Demon Corps? Slaughton's experiment was intended to be a last test of its ability to reach critical status before it would be detonated in a nuclear weapons test in the Bikini Atoll. Slaughton was going to attend and then leave Los Alamos to return to teaching. After the accident, Rufus's detonation was rescheduled to give it time to cool down, but it was eventually melted down in 1946 and returned to the national stockpile. It was very difficult for scientists and doctors to determine how much radiation Slaughton, Daglian, and the others received during their accidents. At the time, the badges that were placed around the room only measured gamma radiation, which left out the large dose of neutron radiation that was released. Slaughton and the observers were not wearing their badges, and badges were also supposed to be placed under tables, but they were not there. Instead, scientists used measurements of activation of sodium in blood and urine samples to estimate the neutron radiation. It's estimated that Daglian may have received 110 R of gamma radiation and 480 R of X-ray radiation. Slaughton may have received 114 R of gamma and 1930 R of X-ray radiation. 500 R is usually fatal in humans. These calculations were done with the methods of the time. After Slaughton's accident, Los Alamos finally stopped critical assembly experiments from being done by hand. All tests after this were done by remote control to protect scientists from radiation exposure. The narrative after the accident was one of Slaughton being a hero for removing the hemisphere quickly and ending the reaction, protecting the other observers from more serious radiation exposure. A quote from the time stated that, quote, Dr. Slaughton's quick reaction at the immediate risk of his own life prevented a more serious development of the experiment, which would have certainly resulted in the death of the seven men working with him, as well as serious injury to others in the general vicinity." Unquote. Alan Graves also hailed Slaughton as a hero for protecting him and the others. However, another observer, Raymer Schreiber, challenged this decades later by stating that Slaughton risked the lives of the team by not following proper safety procedure. As for my personal feelings, I think he is a bit of a mix, but with a heavy lean towards Hero. And it's undeniable the achievements that he contributed to his field. Slaughton's accident was also fictionalized in the 1955 novel, The Accident, and in a 2001 off-Broadway play called the Lewis Slaughton Sonata, and the 1989 film Fat Man and Little Boy, where the character Michael Merriman, played by John Cusack, was based on Slaughton. Slaughton also came up with the name Dollar, as a unit of measurement for criticality processes. Thomas P. Ashlock, an associate editor of the Los Alamos Times newspaper, published a poem in June of 1946 titled Slaughton, a Tribute. It reads as follows. May God receive you, great-souled scientist. While you are with us, even strangers knew the breadth and lofty stature of your mind. Twas only in the crucible of death we saw at last your noble heart revealed. In 1948, the Louis A. Slaughton Memorial Fund was established by his colleagues at Los Alamos and the University of Chicago to fund physics lectures by leading scientists. In 2002, an asteroid was named the 12423 Slaughton. <laughs>